Uh, thank you so much, Jeshri, for your words of welcome, and uh, thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, it's um, actually a very special privilege to have this conversation here with Giv, because uh, Srimoy, could I ask you to move on to the first slide? Because we're celebrating an exhibition that, whilst it's composed of recent work, brings together actually a lifetime of activity through these paintings. I mean, I, for me, the works in Footboard Rider function as forms of recall that bring back to our attention what are really consistent threads in Gives practice. And yes, it's true. Uh, in the process of preparing the catalog of this exhibition, I did realize with a mild shock that I've known Give for 30 years. Uh, we first met at Theosophy Hall uh, in the offices of Nisim Ezekiel, the poet and art critic, who was mentor in different generations to both of us. Uh, and really what, what we're seeing here today, what will unfold here today, is a conversation that takes its place in, in 30 years of public and private conversations that we've had in the course of reading our poetry together or on platforms, uh, my periodic writing on his art, and numerous other occasions when we've, uh, when we've, as we always do, found common ground. So, give I... So, thank you, Ranjit. I, I mean, <laughs> it's, a, it's a delight I mean, to be here present with you, and a privilege, and, and you know, uh, I... I uh, you know, these 30 years have been just wonderful. Thanks so much, Give. Uh, I thought we'd begin um, really by, by invoking the the figure at the heart of the title painting, Footboard Rider. And uh, something that comes to mind when we look at your works is that constantly you're working at the border between two domains, two sorts of equally unknown zones. And the membrane is, is a very important trope in your work, whether that's skin or bark or, as in this case, a window. So could I draw you out on this? And it, it's very present in your poetry as well. There's a constant sense of having to demarcate an inside from an outside and then to protect an inside in some way. Could I draw you out on this? If you're going to begin, Ranjit, with such a difficult question, <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I don't know where we're going to be led. <laughs> um, all right, the membrane. <laughs> Maybe my answer may not be, you know, very direct. It may be kind of, you know, like uh, a searching answer. Uh, I think I have a constant feeling that this body that we inhabit uh, is a is not the is it is not our only uh, station. Uh, Apparently, you know, you know we, we function day to day, you know, we, and, and we are recognized as Give who looks like this, or Ranjit who looks like that. Um, and uh, uh, we assume that this is me, this is Ranjit. I constantly have a feeling that I'm inhabiting realms which are uh, fragile and uh, both to, to the left of what I am and to the right of what I am. And, um, uh, and I think this is important for me to explore these uh, uh, these things that are me and not me. Does that say something? Of course, of course it does. It's, it also speaks to a sense of self that is expansive. It's not only the self that you want contained, but you're also reaching out. Uh, but if I could just pin that to, to this painting, Give uh, the way in which you actually disorient our viewerly reflexes in terms of what is, in fact, inside or outside. And those of you who are familiar with studio practice, this is evident. But uh, could I just draw you out on the way in which, for instance, you've used the reds and oranges, which actually are projective colors, to indicate this sort of recession and the more close, closely you look at the work, the more it actually seems to float in a zero-gravity sort of space. 
Yeah, thank you, Ranjit. That, that's beautiful. Uh, uh, you know, uh, one doesn't begin a painting with a clear idea of where one is going to be led. Uh, but one has, uh, one has uh, hints and indications, you know. So in this case, uh, uh, I, wanted, I wanted the interior of a carriage. I wanted a sleeping figure. I wanted a figure that is outside the window. And then these auxiliary figures, you know, kind of took over slowly as well. Once, uh, you know, this kind of general mapping, uh, you know, had been done, then uh, it is really a question of a day-to-day -day practice. Like almost every day's work leads you to the next day's work, and you don't really know where you're going to be led ultimately. So it's just that uh, uh, where you are led is a question of one trust. You trust something that is leading you somewhere. And secondly, of experience. Because of years of experience, you know that you can trust the trust, you know. Um, and you also know the point at which you will mistrust a moment. So this balancing between trust and mistrust of what you are being led to, or to do is what ultimately makes a painting. So in this case, you know, uh, once I'd established the sleeping figure, and the, I found that the man outside the window, to start with, I thought that I would have him as clearly delineated as the sleeping figure. But after the first kind of almost washing way, wash way in which he has been depicted, uh, all through the painting, you know, each time I would try to delineate him more sharply, Some, something would tell me, don't do it, you know. And right to the end, when the painting was completed, I, I just left him as he was, in, as he appeared in his first impression. And I'm very happy about that. Because it gives him a wraith-like quality, you know. Um, uh, it also emphasizes uh, the strange uh, space that he's inhabiting of danger, of exhilaration, um, of, of doom, you know. Because as we know, many of these footboard riders uh, are, 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 are killed, you know, every day. You know? Of course, I'm not making a, any kind of... Uh, moral stance on this. I know that when you travel by local train, uh, every two minutes there's a lady telling you, you know, on the microphone, don't travel on, on the footboard. And um, here I'm, I would be appearing to encourage people to travel on the footboard. <laughs> we'll make sure Western Railways realizes you're being <laughs> <laughs> But Give, I want to uh, sort of dwell a little bit on certain things you said, the notion of trusting a moment in the process of painting. But I'm thinking back to a point much earlier in your career when perhaps you and many of your contemporaries trusted in the politics of a certain kind of historical moment. I'm thinking particularly of Sudhir, who's here, yourself, uh, Vivan, who's opening shortly, Vivan Sundaram, uh, Gulam Sheikh, Bhupen Khakar, Jogen Chaudhary, a whole set of people who committed themselves at some point in the late 60s and early 70s to the local, the immediate, the regional, with all of its political asymmetries, with what it meant to inhabit that particular kind of milieu. And a number of your early uh, works that have to do with railway stations and platforms are, to my mind, situated in that kind of moment. So if we could just run over those images. Shrimoy, could you, I was going to say, could you play for us? I seem to have Sort of being a sort of musical metaphor, but that is lighted platform, and that's railway platform and um, figure in the landscape. We'll just dwell on this for a while. Uh, Shimoi, could we have figure in the landscape? So I'm sort of juxtaposing this work from the 70s with Football Rider. So do you want to take us through the distance that, in maybe the ideological distance, if you want to call it that? That's uh, this painting was important for me, painted in the 70s, because uh, it was uh, uh, 
just prior to this, I'd been doing a, a whole set of railway platforms with the scrub fields adjacent to them. And uh, the uh, unique thing about these um, platforms was that uh, there were no human figures. And I was repeatedly asked by people, uh, how can you have an Indian railway station with, with doesn't have human, human figures? Uh, and uh, I'd, be, I'd, I know I'd be reduced to having to say, uh, uh, sometimes, you know, at two in the afternoon, <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you stand at Lower Parel Station and the train has gone by, there's a moment when there's almost nobody there except yourself for two minutes. <laughs> but but that, that moment is very pregnant and it reveals to you both the poetry and the architecture of the railway station and the desolation of its environments. And you know, there's something, something achingly beautiful about it. You know, even today, you know, I mean, I, 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 you know, any of our local railway stations, I, I long for that moment when there's nobody there. And, and it's, it's, it's exquisitely beautiful. So anyway, I did a whole set of these works and then this is the uh, time when the figure reappeared. Now this, this structure on the right was going to be a railway, a full, a full fledged railway shed. But when I started painting the figure, the figure started asserting itself. And I thought that I can't have a competitive railway shed on this side. <laughs> uh, so so I, just, uh, I just allowed the shed to remain as a kind of a skeleton. And I found that wonderful because it has a kind of a, or almost a, a science fiction space, uh, a, a, a space uh, figure kind of thing to it. It's, it's, it, it doesn't define itself and yet you know that it does belong somewhere ar ar around the railway uh, station, but not quite. And then the hills in the background are the whole horizontal range of hills which you see from Thane station, you know. Uh, so that three or four things, uh, and of course the, the railway porter on the left. So three or four things uh, came together in this painting, uh, which you know, I, I was very grateful for. You mentioned science fiction, and again it comes to me that evidently at some point in the early or mid-70s, a number of you, certainly Sudhir Patwardhan and you, seem to have been drawing on science fiction as a way of uh, dealing with questions of time, of identity. I'm thinking here of some of Sudhir's drawings from that period where the portrait becomes a trope for uh, time travel. And you mentioned just now that there was a kind of science fictional feel that you were was one of the things you were thinking about. Was that a major motif at all? No, I, in your I, reading, I, I, I don't think it was, no. Uh, it, 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 it was almost an accident. And I think that uh, uh, when we come to the wells, for instance, uh, later, uh, uh, no, I mean, like decades later, there's a recent well with the four pillars, where again the four pillars reflected in the water uh, have a kind of a, a science fiction sense, you know. But, but these are, as far as I'm concerned, these are mere accidents. Whereas in Sudhi's case, those portraits are very conscious uh, 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 ventures into projecting the human uh, face into different uh, time segments. And here, the figure of the porter seems to still carry some of that erratic isolation that you would find in the figures of the generation before yours. And I've often in my mind thought of how the figures of the, of the prophet, for instance, in a lot of Akbar Padamsi's work. And Sousa. And yeah. Sousa. Uh, reflects a kind of self-containment, uh, kind of crackling intensity and a containment, really. Uh, this seems to have some of that. But uh, Shimoi, if you could move on to the next one. In works like these, you completely dismantle that isolation of the figure. And the figure, the, the human subject, is seen much more in, uh, in its social circumstances with others. So do you want to talk a little about the kinds of expeditions that led you to works like these? I'm thinking of statements you've made occasionally, uh, fragments that appear in your poetry, uh, that in which you talk about 
the interface with the street, the view from the clinic, yes. or the railway station. Could, you, could I draw you out on this? Yes. Uh, I, I will come to that, but before that, since we've got this image, and that is also our, our railway compartment. And I mean, decades done, decades, decades earlier, before the footboard rider. And, and uh, I want to come back to something that you said, which was so perceptive, which is that uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the solidity of the compartment, uh, for some reason, when I paint it, uh, almost kind of disappears into uh, a, a weightless space which has happened in Footboard Rider, and it's happened here as well, you know? I mean, there are men standing at the door, facing the uh, uh, landscape outside, and there's the interior and the fans and all of that. But it's not a, it's not a very clearly defined inner space, you know? It is a space which could be uh, anywhere, you know? And, and, and I just wanted to, you know, say how beautifully you had articulated this uh, quality uh, in, the, in the previous painting, but it, it's so here as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, uh, quickly about um, the, the iconic isolated figure which appears in the work of Akbar Padamsi, Souza, Tayab Mehta, uh, people you know, who have worked a generation before me and who I admire very greatly. Uh, uh, I grew up with those images. And they meant a great deal to me. And behind all of them, remember, is Tagore and his heads. You know? uh, so I've never really, uh, I've never really been, I think that Bhupen Kakar and Ghulam Muhammad Sheikh are the two painters who very strongly felt the need to shake off this generation this earlier generation of painters, you know? And they, and, and they did it to their, to their own benefit. I think that shaking off Akbar and, and, and Tayyab was important to them. And I think that, that they found their own vision by doing so. Whereas in my case, I never felt the need to shake off Akbar and Tayyab. I saw them as participant, you know, with my own inner activity. You know, I wanted to carry them along, yeah. you know, and uh, uh, I, I, think, I think I've learned a lot, you know, from them and, and I hope that uh, some of their extraordinary quality uh, as artists has trickled into some of my work. Uh, but that said, uh, I also had strong sympathies with, the, with Bhupen's and Gulam's worldview. You know, because I, I'm of their generation. And I, I could not, of course, you know, just continue to repeat what Akbar and Tayyab had done. Uh, I wanted to go out into the world, you know. Uh, I thought that the four walls of the studio were, uh, were too suffocating, you know. And uh, so the street, the railway platform, you know, and so on. And of course, once you are out there, you know, a, 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 you have to have more than one figure in a painting. Uh, although I've done many paintings with one figure as well. <laughs> and as soon as you have more than one figure, then, you know, this question of relationship immediately comes into the question, you know. Like, what are they saying to each other? What are they doing to each other? You know? I like the way you rephrased how we think about the, the succession of generations. Because usually the narrative of the avant-garde is an Oedipal one. There's usually the notion that you supplant, overthrow and supplant an earlier generation. But I liked the fact that you touched on notions of continuity. But uh, it also strikes me that even as you, you held on to what you really cherished in the work of Akbar, Tayyab, um, and um, Souza, and others in that generation, uh, in, a, in a work like this one, for instance, Man in the Rain, and both the works that share that title, uh, Something else comes into play which rarely, if ever, did in the works of those who came before you. And I'm thinking here of the category of class in a certain way. And I think that's, that, that's a kind of intersection between that generation and your own, in your work. It's very clear that you're looking at the marginal figure, the figure uh, 
restrained and constrained by factors of class. So could I, could I ask you to talk about this? I mean, it's a yeah. figure that's clothed in a very particular kind of social habitus. Yes. I think both these figures, the one and the previous one, uh, are figures you can identify as belonging to the lower middle class. Uh, maybe even lower, lower middle class. You know? uh, and of course, in many of my other figures are, are, are frankly proletarian. Uh, I find them more beautiful. I, 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 find, I, find, I find them more beautiful than the middle class. I'm sorry to say this. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, I think a painter who paints the middle class will be looking at psychology, at character, at uh, status, uh, things like that. Uh, whereas uh, when I look at uh, uh, a, 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 you know a sweeper in the street or uh, uh, somebody who's you know selling vegetables in a rally or in a second class. Uh, which used to be at one time called a third class compartment in a train, which I much prefer traveling in rather than the first. Uh, uh, there's a kind of a vitality and a vigor, you know, in the body and the face, in the expressions, uh, which I feel very drawn, drawn to. So it's very visceral, the, the, the choice. But there's also, there's also, Deficit and distortion, and all the all the wages exacted by poverty and dispossession, absolutely. which also you've dwelt on in your uh, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely right. Uh, I sometimes used to feel that uh, one should do no painting of an Indian figure who is lower than lower middle class without showing some loss of limb, so to speak because I think that this country has uh, dealt cruelly uh, with poor people. Uh, and it's something that, you know, it doesn't require any great cleverness to see this. It's, it's apparent all over the place. We've talked about this often, but maybe we can revisit this topic once again, Give what? What inspired you at an early point in your, now in your medical career to move out of the metropolis and, um, so to speak, go back to the villages? And you spent at least two and a half years there. Could you, t could you talk a little bit about that experience? Well, it uh, seems to connect with what you just said before. Yeah. For one thing, uh, uh, my parents come from a, a, a village in Gujarat. Uh, and of course, they moved to Bombay. And I was born here and raised in Bombay. But we kept going back to the village uh, uh, every holiday and you know, very frequently. And my grandfather owned uh, an estate of 350 acres uh, in that area, Dhanu area. You know? And the labor uh, uh, for his estate were uh, aborigines. They were tribals, Warlis. Uh, so from a very early age, uh, you know, I was... Uh, I was closely exposed to this whole village of workers. And um, I, was, I was absolutely fascinated by them, you know. I, I, I found them much more interesting than my family. <laughs> and um, and, and uh, I would keep, you know, wanting to go and spend time with them. And I did, you know. Uh, and the family would keep drawing me back, saying, You'll get leprosy, you'll get tuberculosis, you know. And, and they're not wrong, because both leprosy and tuberculosis was rampant in the tribal population. Uh, but that, that early exposure, uh, you know, is, is something that is, you know, is lifelong, uh, 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 it's, it's made a lifelong impact on me. I don't think I'll, I'll, I'll ever want to or ever get over it. We're going to switch terrain completely now. And Shrimoy, oh, there you are. Yes. Uh, but perhaps not. I'm thinking here of this painting, which 
to me, having spent a lot of time looking at the works in Footboard Rider, this seems to me to be the most uh, demanding of the works in an exhibition that has many compelling works in it. I'm going to try and approach it through a more formal detour before we <laughs> begin to ask ourselves what is going on in the action of the work. Uh, Give, I'd like you to dwell a little bit on how media photography has played a role in your work as a point of departure. Pictures seen in the newspapers or in magazines and so forth because this image has its origins in the domain of sport. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Ranjit. Uh, uh, you know, uh, very early on when I first started to paint, uh, and you know, I was really kind of thinking of Akbar Padamsi, uh, uh, Souza, Tayab, and I was, you know, you need you need some some a model, and I was trying to paint like them. And of course, I was not getting anywhere, because you know, I I I uh, I was I was from a different generation, so my whole the whole way that I was formed couldn't have allowed me to paint like them. And at this point, uh, I was you know, also in close contact with our common mentor, uh, Nisim Ezekiel. Uh, I must have been around the age of like, you know, uh, in my 20s, you know, 20, 26, and something like that, 25, 26. And Nisim would have been in his 40s? Yes? Yes. And uh, he had been reading my poems and looking at my painting. And he once said to me, uh, you know, there's so many things uh, around us that need to be talked about. Uh, he said, beggars. He said, nobody's written about beggars in a, in a way that makes sense. Or, he said, um, when you walk in a very dirty Bombay street, you'll suddenly see a man coming towards you in a spotlessly clean white dhoti. I mean, these are kind of like, like flashes of light thrown at one at that age, you know. And uh, it suddenly struck me, you know, that yes, I have to understand, you know, I have to understand this amazing environment in which I'm living. Why am I trying to do Akbar's prophets and, uh, you know, um, Souza's uh, tortured men? I, you know, they don't belong to me, you know. And, uh, and so I was searching, you know, for what I could claim as my own. And suddenly I started, you know, one day discovered that in the newspapers, there was at that time a continuous flow of images of politicians uh, who were being garlanded. <laughs> you know, politicians garlanding each other, politicians receiving gifts, politicians being feted. And of course, they were all, you know, fairly worthless people. Uh, and so I said, ah. Yeah, that's something I can focus on. So I would take the newspaper photograph, which would be a black and white photograph, and I would recreate it in a painting. And I found to my delight that it was kind of like a kind of a yoga, you know? Because the newspaper, paint, uh, the newspaper image is a bit splotchy and un unclear, and yet it gives you enough material so that when you start painting it, uh, stroke by stroke, you are both going with it, but you're also going against it and asserting something else. And by the end of it, this congratulatory uh, photograph in the newspaper became mm, a somewhat sly, uh, tongue-in-cheek, uh, uh, judgmental painting on the political scene. So, uh, so that's how, what, how my, how my uh, in an initiation with you know, using uh, photographic images started. 
And then, of course, throughout my career, I started using photographs clicked by me, clicked by others, from newspapers, and so on. And this one of, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, this one, of course, is a, a sports image, you know? It's, uh, uh, maybe someone has lost a goal, I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know the names of the uh, protagonists, but I was, I was amazed by the drama of it. And I just picked it up, and I again went, you know, slowly through it. And as I went through it, I found that there was a drama way beyond the goal <laughs> or the lost goal, you know. There was, a, there was an immense drama, you know, which I could explore. And, you know, that was the attempt. Because when I first saw it, I mean, I was in... Uh in several minds, in many minds, in fact. I mean, there's one part of my training which just drew me towards reading it. I mean, it's a Trecento painting, Giotto, something about the language of the gesture, the suggestions of a saint being betrayed. Many of these things came up, or might it be from some other period in art history that a claim was being made? That was one set of concerns. What is the symbolic language of this work? But what struck me with equal force was that you had gone out into a zone of risk in speaking of tenderness between two men. There is actually a clear reference to a certain homo homoerotic kinship. So that struck me also as being, uh, you know, both of these things held in mind at the same time, uh, made for a very special kind of viewing experience. So was, were both these elements in the greater drama that you perceived in the work? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I was aware almost from the beginning of the work, that the homoerotic element uh, is very strongly present. You know? And I decided that I was not going to shy away from it. You know? And at the same time, I was not going to melodramatize it either. You know? I said, let it come in as much as it needs to. But I think that it was not the only or the primary uh, uh, impulse uh, for me behind the image. I think Perhaps, if I want to kind of really put my finger on it, what was the deepest uh, 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 impulse was one of uh, an intense exchange of emotion between two men. I mean, I was very aware, for instance, that I wanted their cheeks to be literally, you know, touching each other, you know, because I wanted the physicality of it aside from the emotional uh, con content. Yeah. And uh, uh, the other interesting thing is that a painting you know, is not complete until everything about it is complete. Like a friend of mine who visited the studio and saw it at, a, at an incomplete stage said to me, but, but it's ready, isn't it? You know, you can see that there are these two men embracing each other. And I said to him, no, the colors are not yet embracing. <laughs> so, it was when the colors succeeded in embracing each other that the painting was complete. That is one of those Mahavakyas after which you should keep very quiet. <laughs> but, but unfortunately, we must proceed relentlessly, and we will. Uh, Trimoy, could we have the meditations on old age, please? I thought we got to these precisely because of the things you just said, uh, Give uh, One, of course, is the, this amazing idea of the embrace of color. And also, the, there's a very particular use to which you put chromatic effects in your work. They're not in, uh, far from being realistic in any way. Actually, there's something else that goes on in this series. Uh, and I was struck this time, because these are impulses I've felt the presence of in your work. But I was struck by how, while on the one hand, you were looking at the vulnerable, the mortal subject, the body subject to time and to decay, you nonetheless had a certain festive approach. And I've glossed this in the essay by talking about how it's as though you have a simultaneous philanthropic impulse, which leads you to empathize with the mortal, the mortal subject.
But there's also a certain misanthropic impulse in your work, always has been, as early as poems like Servants, for instance, something comes to mind, uh, that comes to mind instantly. But across, uh, whether it's your poetry or your paintings, there's this dual sense of how you respond to the human subject, and possibly also, therefore, to yourself. Do you want to talk a little bit about this? Yeah, this is a set of uh, four images. Uh, they're quite small, actually, uh, called uh, Meditations on Old Age. Um, they are oil on board, and uh, I've been thinking for a long time of doing them. I wanted to convey the inevitable, you know, decay of the human being as he comes closer to old age. Um, but I thought that I don't want to do it uh, in a very obvious way. So for one thing, I said, let me have a splash of color, you know, which will immediately kind of go counter to the idea of, oh, so heavy, you know. Uh, so that in itself becomes then a technical challenge, you know. How do I use uh, bright color uh, and yet convey decay, you know, and decrepitude? Uh, that accounts for the choice of the palette. Uh, about the, about the, mm, the philanthropic and the misanthropic impulse, uh, you're very mischievous, <laughs> Ranjit. You know? <laughs> uh, you're telling me that I don't like human beings. <laughs> Which is true. <laughs> Uh, I mean, there's nothing very original in this. I think that Freud, you know, very clearly said, and for all time, I think, that in our closest relationships, there is the element of ambivalence. In fact, the closer you are to somebody, both love and hate function in the strongest possible way. And you'd better be aware of it. <laughs> Uh, maybe, maybe I'm being a bit too theatrical, <laughs> but, but there's something in this. Uh, and I think the husbands and wives, you know, who have lived together for many, many years successfully know this. Uh, and they know how to navigate the negative moments. They learn how to do it. And I think an artist needs to learn the same thing, you know. Uh, he's not always going to love his subjects. I mean, uh, I'm doing these four decaying old people, you know, which in a way is an anticipation of what's going to happen to me soon. And uh, don't ask me to love it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the ambivalence that, that I feel towards my decay over the years is going to be present in the ambivalence that I feel towards these four figures. And I did not hold it back, you know. So like uh, the, you know, the kind of almost blind uh, way in which this, this figure is trying to, to find the light. Or in the next one, please. Uh, this almost uh, kind of diagrammatic uh, uh, exploration of sickness, you know. Is she vomiting, you know. She can't even sit straight, you know, she's bending forward. And what's happened to her eyelids? They're full of veins. Right. Next, please. And this figure where uh, the skin of the face, you know, in old age, uh, because of the loss of muscle power behind it, becomes like a sheet. So it becomes expressionless. And on that face, it's even difficult to find the lips where you can put the lipsticks accurately. So the lipstick becomes a kind of a slash, you know, across this old face. And next. And this gentleman, you know, who I saw whizzing past me in a car, seated in the back seat. Uh, I mean, can this wig save him? <laughs> it can't, you know. 
so these are cruel paintings. But mm, so young and yet so cruel. <laughs> so old and yet so cruel. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But I thought we could also um, trace back. But, but let me talk to you about the paint, you know, in these works, you know. I mean, I think that what saves these works ultimately, you know, uh, is the paint. Because I've used paint in, them, in these works in a very specific kind of way. Uh, it, I've, I've given all the power of vitality which the, f which the subject does not have to the way the paint is used. So it's a transference, you know, of power uh, from the decaying subject to the quality of the paint, which makes it hopefully into a work of art. No, absolutely. I mean, those impulses of the vitality in the, in the pigment, the brushwork, all of that is at odds with the ostensible subject of it. But I thought we could, we could look a little at the itinerary along which you come to these works. Uh, you used to call it your gallery of man from the 80s. So, Srimoyi, I don't know if we could course through some of these images. That's crushed head from 84, drowned woman. These were hanged man. I mean, these, these represent a very different sort of uh, understanding of vulnerability not festive at all. It was much more... I wonder what it was about the early 80s when all things around us, I mean, my own sense of it, I mean, belong to different generations, but there's a tremendous sense of the country descending into schism and chaos, and there was... A, today we might be inured to it, but in the early 80s, those cataclysms were very real. Um, dowry killings, um, riots, massacres, all of these seemed just very, very not normal in the way they seem to have become normalized now. So I don't know if you want to speak to that <coughs> moment briefly. Sorry, please. Uh, I, think, I think that, you know, you have a slightly thinner skin when you are young. You know, so like when you're in your 30s and, and early 40s, uh, all the terrible things that are happening around you in your country and in the world, they affect you, you know, uh, they really bruise you. In a way, like when you are 60 and 70, you know, you become blasé, you know, and you suddenly kind of say, well, it's always been like this, it always will be like this. So I think that the artistic production of anyone uh, around, when, when around the ages of 30 and 40 has that special quality of vulnerability, which he or she may carry on in, to later age, but is that first encounter with, with the horror of, and the sorry, sorrow of, of our life. That suggests that there's a kind of arc along which you become uh, less and less um, sensitized to these things, or that you become more philosophical or stoic. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know. It's not quite no, no, like I'm not that. not disputing yeah, it. Yeah, 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 I know, I understand. Not quite like that. But there is obviously a, a, a qualitative change. I mean, one thing is, you know, that when you're 30, you know, and you read about a riot, and you read about what somebody's done to someone, you know, you can spend a whole day, uh, two days, a week, uh, you know, recovering from it, you know, and not knowing what to think and feel. You can't feel that way when you are 60 and 70. You know, you recover much faster, <laughs> sadly. Uh, the, 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 the trauma is there, you know. You do feel the trauma. But it's, it's kind of modified by the fact that you already told yourself it's never going to change. But having said that, some images have traveled with you across three or four decades. And I'm thinking here of the next set of images we look at, the mourners. Uh, now the, I'm not going to call them the originals or prototypes, but the first time you addressed some of these themes, uh, Shrimoyi, could we see all the three mourners? Uh, these images have their origins in drawings you made in the 70s. Yes. Uh, could we just, uh, Shrimoyi, go on to those images and then flash back and forward? So, could we attend to the mystery of these 
images that seem to possess your imagination and which have not gone away. They yeah. retain their enigma and their trauma. <coughs> Thank you, Ranjit. Yes. Uh, the drawings were done in the 70s and they were taken from newspaper images of widows, uh, you know, people who had been widowed in riots. And uh, I found them so moving, you know, and so affect affecting that I was not content with doing just one drawing of a particular head. You know, there are several versions, you know, I kept on doing them over and over again. And then, and then these drawings were just left aside for years and years, uh, till uh, like almost 30 years, you know, until at uh, 30 years later, I, I, I think I was still carrying the weight of this sorrow, you know. And uh, I, said, I said, I can go one step further. I can make paintings out of them. So, Srimoy, we can go back to the paintings. And the others. Yeah, one painting each of the, you know. And of course, you know, the... Again, the technical thing of making a painting from a drawing, which you know you've done 30 years ago, is again fascinating. You know, and and uh, and you know, this is the thing that th this is the thing about art. Any art, you as a writer know this. As a poet, you know it. You know that whatever you address, it is the doing of it that makes it. Yeah, that's true. But I'm also, as, as you speak, I'm mapping this onto a text that I return to every now and again, which is uh, Said's On Late Style, Edward Said, where he's um, reflecting on, it was, his it was actually posthumously published, so we don't know quite what he would have done with the book. But um, he reflects on the kinds of freedom that might become available to an artist in the later phase of his work. What sorts of things might he leave behind and experiment with new things? What latitude might he give himself? Questions like this, which I find myself thinking about when I look at your more recent work. But I'm also thinking of continuities um, such as what you view, what you return to from your, what you inherit from the legacies. Uh, could we just have the weeping woman, Shimai, uh, flashing forward to beyond the drawings? <coughs> I remember when I first saw this work uh, at the studio, and you were still working on it, uh, and we had a very interesting conversation about how for you it was Roger van der Weyden, for instance, who was always with you in a certain way, Matthias Grunewald. Uh, these, if you will, archetypes of lamentation or grief or sorrow, uh, these are things you've carried with you always. So could you dwell a little bit on, on, on these images, which are part of your working vocabulary and your... Sure. Well, uh, you know, um, it's a weeping woman. Uh, for a long time, there are two images of the weeping woman uh, which, uh, which really held me. One is the weeping woman of Picasso, uh, where he shows you, you know, it's a jagged, jagged work, you know, with a handkerchief and, and you know, almost comic book tears kind of uh, coming out of her eyes and, and distorted face. And it is such a strong work that you almost feel that you can see the, see the snot uh, in her nose, you know, which is a result of this excessive weeping. So that's one kind of a weeping woman. And then, of course, there's the uh, weeping woman of Roger van der Weyden, 14th century Flemish painter, where he shows the Virgin Mary at the foot of the cross, uh, in a state of extreme inward sorrow. But her face is, uh, is calm. Maybe calm is not the word, but it is, you know, it is, it is not distorted. It is, it is a, it is a, it's just a beautiful face. And there's a pearl-like tear flowing down her cheek. You know, in contrast to Picasso's comic book tears, you know, kind of jetting out of the face. And I said, I mean, two versions of the weeping woman which are so different. 
And I said, I have a weeping woman in my chest, breast, mm -hmm. you know. And what is my weeping woman like? And so that's why I started to work on this painting. Uh, you can hardly see the tears. It's on the left side of the face. Uh, tears are very difficult, you know. Yeah, they are very difficult. Uh, it, it can, you know, they can ruin a painting. Blood, blood, again, you know, is something very difficult to paint, you know. It can ruin a painting. So, uh, so I had this woman, and I, I thought I could get her sorrow partly by, by chopping off parts of her face, like the chin, you know, not being completely seen, and the cowl covering her. And, uh, and these two suggestions of tears, and slightly reddened eyes. And a face which looks like it's part of the earth, you know. And then, and then to counterpoint that with a very serene background, you know, of cloud and hills and fields. So that was one version of the weeping woman uh, that, <laughs> that I tried. And we're now going to vault over a lot of your work and get to looking into a well, a spray of blossoms. In a way, this journey tracks us across also everything you do in terms of unmaking the figure. I mean, through the drawings that we saw in a, in a flash. Uh, but I want to move really from the weeping woman to this entire body of work which you've had, Give the Wells, because that represents a completely different pole of your imagination. And there are now nearly 25 yes, wells. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. How did it begin? Yeah, yeah well, uh, it started in 1991. Uh, I think that would be when I was 51. And, um, you know, uh, I've always looked into wells. And if you are, if you are uh, you know, if you are part of a small village in Gujarat, uh, uh, a seaside village, you have all these beautiful little wells which get filled to the brim in the monsoon uh, and can get pretty deep in the summer. And I always looked into them. So strangely enough, in the, in, at around the age of 51, and I've never stopped looking into them. Even today, you know, if I pass by a well, I'll look into it. <laughs> and uh, so uh, uh, around the age of 51, suddenly this notion came to me, you know, uh, since this experience seems to be so important for me, do I think I could depict it in a painting? And I put that challenge to myself, and I produced one work. And I was happy with it. And in the production of that one work, I became aware that one of the most important things in painting the subject is that one, when one looks into a well, one is looking perpendicularly down into the earth. When you want to paint it, you are changing your perspective completely because you're putting the canvas on the wall and you are facing it. And you are uh, giving that ex experience in, on this plane. And that makes all the difference. You know? So uh, I did this well, which shows the sides of the well, some vegetation on the, uh, in the inside of the well, a little bit on the outside, and the reflection on the surface of the water. And I said, that's it, I've done it. But a couple of months later, I felt the impulse to, to, to try the subject again with different uh, images. And I tried that, and it, I was very happy with it. And then again, and, and I, again and again, you know, until I became aware at one point that happily, this subject matter is never going to leave me. <laughs> and uh, by now, there are something like 25 wells. Uh, each one of them is a distinct and separate experience. They are not formal exercises, you know, in style. Yeah? They have certain things in common, 
but each one is different in mood, in treatment, in imagery, you know, which is why, you know, it is a sustained activity for me. I remember the first well of yours that I ever saw, it belonged to my neighbor, he was my neighbor then, Ajay Lakhanpal. Uh, and I remember seeing it then and uh, thinking this is like a porthole. I mean, it, precisely the experience that you said. I had this strange sense of again being disoriented because you're looking at and not into the well. And when you look at it that way, it seems to suggest something else. A wormhole, a journey into another world. All those kinds of meanings seem to come out because of the shift in how you're looking at the well. Uh, but also give... a could, could I draw you out a little bit on how this allows you, the wells, as, as a part of your practice, they allow you to, if you like, explore an abstractionist aspect of your, <coughs> of your being. And that's something that's completely at, at the opposite end from what you might want to call the figurative preoccupations yeah. you have. Yeah. Do you want to dwell on that a little? Uh, yeah, well, uh, uh, I've always loved abstract art, you know. And um, uh, although I've, I've never felt the, I never felt the impulse to be a totally abstract artist myself, but in every painting, you know, even if it is dealing with a human figure, uh, if I'm dealing with you know a part of a, fa a head or a, or a, or an arm, I'm totally aware of the abstraction that is going on, you know, because there are strokes which are relating to each other, you know which may have nothing to do with the hand and have everything to do with the hand at the same time. So it is this uh, depicting an object and being completely uh, free from it, which is the abstract impulse. Uh, and uh, in certain uh, works, uh, it takes over in a m much more obvious and dramatic way. For instance, in my cloud drawings, you know, where uh, you know, I depict clouds by linear exploration. And of course, as you said, in the wells, you know, because uh, what you have given is that there is a circle or a triangle or an oblong area. It could get more of a sense of a trimoy, could we just, yeah. 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 And things which are outside and things which are inside. And things which are inside are a sense of reflection, you know. Here are those four pillars which are science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> also foliage not so. and what's that? And not so. <laughs> not so, indeed, yeah. so, uh, so uh, yeah, this is well with the reflecting the full moon, you know. And we could maybe, yes, this is. This is an image that has moved far, far beyond the studio and the domain of art. It's the logo of the India Foundation for the Arts. Yes. <laughs> and I think it's known to lots and lots of people just out of that. But it's a, it's a work that's fascinated me forever. Uh, you do have a poem about Nachiket and Yama, the Kata yes, Upanishad. Yes, yes, yes. I've always been struck by the way in which the water buffalo plays some kind of role in your work and the suggestions of Sacrifice, the journey to death, illumination, were these, were these concerns active for you when you were working on this? Uh, you know, the water buffalo, uh, again, is something that I've seen in my village, Nargol, in the water tank. And that's the title of this painting, you know, the water tank at Nargol. Uh, and uh, I spend hours sitting at the bank of the water tank watching these water buffaloes, you know. I think they're ethereal creatures. <laughs> I mean, the, the, uh, how is it possible to be so uh, content with one's lot? You know? Uh, so I really admire them for it. I mean, if they, are, if, they are, if they are immersed in the water, they want nothing else, you know? <laughs> and, uh, uh, and of course then, 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 no. Uh, th there are there are kind of literary and and and, and scriptural allusions. I mean, Yam uh, Yam uh, is supposed to be riding on a water buffalo when he comes to take you away, uh, and that 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 always kind of stays with me, except that I feel that 
to me, Yama is redeemed by the fact that he rides a water buffalo. <laughs> he should say thank you to the water buffalo. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that's what it is, you know, this the beautiful water tank at Nargol. There's a, there's a, the whole right side of the painting is occupied by the lower portion of a tree, you know, the bark, the, the bark and the roots, the trunk and the roots. And you're looking beyond that into the pond uh, from where the bird is taking flight and the young boy is uh, washing the water buffaloes, which is something you, know, you see again and again, you know. Uh, these little boys, they torment the buffaloes, but they also look after them well. Uh, and, and, you know, the, 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 the sunset splashing the uh, water of the, the muddy water into a kind of a beautiful, or, you know, muddy orange. Yeah. Uh, and incidentally, it's one of uh, Matisse's paintings that's behind this. Um, uh, the one in the... Uh, uh, Institute of Art at Chicago, uh, which is called Bathers, where uh, half of the painting is occupied by just the river bank, you know, like that. It's almost like a, bl like a one thing. And it's in the second half that the bathers are depicted. And, the, and, and that kind of stayed with me, you know. So that in my, when, I go, when I got here, and I started this painting, I said half of the painting will be taken over by the, by the, bar, by the trunk of the tree. And the, 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 what's happening, it will, it will take place in the other half. <laughs> it's a work like this that kind of reminds, certainly reminds me, reminds us, reminds me of how, how the image makes itself in a strange way. I mean, you talked of all the everyday experiences that are encoded in the work. And yet they all have these metaphorical resonances. There's an act, there's kind of resonance that ripples out. And what might you need to know or be trained in or just to have grown up with for images to just announce themselves? Uh, this remains to me a mystery. This is not really a question. I mean, I look at the bird and some deep part of me just says Paramahamsa, the great swan. And that starts off a certain journey of reading the work. So I don't know, maybe if we could, before we open this out, have these questions been active for you, Give Questions of what the audience brings to your work? Uh, what is the leap that the audience might need to make? Or what sorts of readings might a painting open itself to? Uh, you know, the audience is... Uh, the audience, for me, is both ever-present and totally absent. Uh, I know when I'm painting, you know, that this painting is ultimately going to be seen by uh, other friends who are painters, by writers, by my gallerist. Uh, so I know that it is, a, it is going to be a shared thing. But uh, it is also totally private. And when I'm working on it, I am not at all concerned with their possible approval or, or disapproval. Um, so it is a position of both humility uh, and of complete arrogance. Uh, because when I finish a work and I feel that it is good, and sometimes it may take me even a few weeks to, to come to the point of approving of it myself, then no disapproval coming from outside is going to shake my opinion. But the fact that it is going to be shared is also tremendously important. I think that if I felt that a work I'm doing is never going to be seen by anybody else, it would be horror, it would be terrible. You know. Which might be the logical moment to open this out to questions. Forgive. <laughs> 